All this is Dr. Mubin Sayed from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. So the discussion today is about a study. It is a, a study from Netherlands, an amazing study. It has actually corrected so many of my concepts about muscle fatigue, post-exertional malaise, and um, the me me mechanisms behind that. So we have been studying this together uh, long COVID and then the muscle issues, which we have been thinking about, possibly blood vascular problems, for example, endotheliitis of the blood vessels, causing the swelling of the blood vessel walls, narrowing the blood supply routes, or microclots present within the blood vessels, or oxygen carrying capacity problems, or the neuromuscular junction, where the nerves and the muscles, they join or they work together, the abnormalities and in inflammation and autoantibodies over there, or antibody attacks on myosin, or sorry, myelin sheath of the nerves, or neurological issues, which are then translated into the problems with the muscle fiber movement, or autoantibody attack on the muscle fibers themselves, for example, molecular mimicry or cross reactivity, or mitochondrial damage. So we have been looking at many of these mechanisms. This is at least my first time that I'm seeing this study where they are saying it is actually the muscle fiber type. And I would explain this. It is actually the muscle fiber type that becomes changed in long COVID patients. Because of that muscle fiber type, muscle type switching, it becomes difficult for patient to be able to have exercise and power capacity in their muscles. And the study, the researchers wanted to study post-exertional malaise, which is, so imagine if you are doing an exercise, what would happen is you'll become sore the next day or day after, and then you'll become okay. However, in the post-exertional malaise condition, slight activity, mild activity, will cause not only fatigue, but also severe muscle pains, disability, brain fog, cognitive issues. So an exaggerated symptom set would appear and would continue for days. Patient will recover, but it would be after a few days. This will be an immediate punishment if you ask the patient of or for the exercise that they did. So the researchers wanted to understand that what is going on behind this post-exertional malaise. And this is the first study I'm seeing where they did a biopsy of the muscle. And then they looked into the muscle of post-exertional exertional malaise patients to say what is happening inside the muscle. And that is amazing. So let's start this uh, study. It might take a little bit of a time because there are so many mechanisms that they went through. So take your coffee, tea, sit down, settle down, and there will be a little bit of a uh, explanation for various mechanisms that they have. So let's start. So this is drbean.com. So if you would like to have more medical lectures, please get access to drbean.com. This is the study. It is printed, published in Nature Communications, 4th January 2024. Muscle abnormalities worsen after post-exertional malaise in long COVID. So before we actually look at the study, I want to share one more thing. Because since I've been discussing this study with others, they continue to ask me one question. What is the solution? And in the light of this study, I believe that the important part, blood thinning, IVIGs, uh, blood electrophoresis, no, the most important part is to start slowly getting your muscles back into movement. And the reason for that, let me show you that. So the clinical aspect, I think we should know so you can look at this. So here is a journal of physiology here it says 
Adult skeletal muscle undergoes conversion between these fiber types in response to exercise. Endurance training induces the transition from fast twitch to slow, whereas strength training results in slow twitch to fast. Now, important thing to consider is that for the post-exertional malaise patients, doing training of any kind actually triggers the PEM. So you have to actually very slowly work your way out of it. So you have to relax and you have to slowly start doing light exercises, maybe start with yoga and then slowly come out of it. Now let's go over the study. And I also, near the end of this talk, I'm going to show you this uh, NPR's article about this study, a discovery in the muscles of long COVID patients may explain exercise troubles. And the my it is a cringe-worthy article for me for the carelessness of the actual mechanis mechanisms and the treatment of them over here and how badly these are treated. So we'll look into this later on. Let's look at the study itself with my <laughs> diagrams. Okay, so here we are. So this is the study. Uh, you might find this uh, screen to be very clear and without any interface. Do you know that I wrote this in C Sharp by myself in last one month? I write software as well. And so I wrote it because I was getting sick of all of that interface and I thought I would just write my own drawing program and presentation program without the interface. So <clears throat> this is my program the presentation is running on. So first of all, post-exertional malaise. Post-exertional malaise is the worsening of symptoms following even minor physical or mental exertion. With symptoms typically worsening 12 to 48 hours after activity and lasting for days or even weeks so you crash after the exercise and not just the physical exercise, even mental activity can lead to the crash. Do you know why? When we are doing mental activity, our brain's excitatory state goes up, which causes the brain to send signals out to muscle as well and cause the muscles to have a higher tone, make them alert that higher tone is equal to the muscles for their activity. Okay, so plus there are other mechanisms too. I'm, I'm keeping ourselves in the context of today's um, talk and that is about the muscles. Now, I wanna read the abstract first. So you have an idea of what is overall they're talking about so that when we look at the mechanisms, it makes sense. Abstract is a subgroup of patients infected with SARS-CoV-2 remain symptomatic over three months after infection. A distinctive symptom of patients with long COVID is post-exertional malaise, which is associated with a worsening of fatigue and pain-related symptoms after acute mental or physical exercise. But it is underlying, but its underlying pathophysiology is unclear. With this longitudinal case control study, we provide new insights into the pathophysiology of post-exertional malaise in patients with long COVID. Please make sure you watch this or you read this. If you don't like the video, read the, the study. It is such an important turning point in understanding the post-exertional malaise and not only for COVID, but for ME-CFS as well. We show that the skeletal muscle structure is associated with a lower exercise capacity in patients. So their exercise capacity is reduced and local and systemic metabolic, metabolic disturbances, severe exercise induced myopathy, muscle damage and tissue infiltration of amyloid containing deposits in skeletal muscles of patients with long COVID worsen after induction of post exertional malaise. And so the within the tissue, there is bad, badly folded, incorrect proteins that are piling up, trash that is piling up. This study highlights novel pathways that help to understand the pathophysiology of post-exertional malaise in patients suffering from long COVID and other post-infectious diseases. This actually covers other viral 
uh, infections and the MECFS like outcomes or other post-exertional malaise pathologies. So this is their abstract. Let's look at the summary first. First of all, let's look at the incoming blood vessels. So they did not find any issue with the blood vessels. So I'm hoping that you're keeping in mind all the mechanisms that we have discussed. And now we're going to go over one by one. So the first one, incoming blood vessels, they are swollen. They, are, um, they do not have enough capacity in them because of inflammation in their walls and they're not bringing in blood correctly. And then there is hypoxia. So at least in the biopsies of these patients and in the blood draws that they did, they did not find any issue with their blood vessels. So what they had done was, I should actually explain this, in the study they had 25 long COVID patients who were mobile patients, about 4,000 um, steps a day or something, uh, activity was being done. And they compared them to healthy individuals who had COVID and then they became recovered but were healthy. And what they did was they did many blood draws. Then they did a um, biopsy of vastus lateralis, that is a muscle on the side of the thigh. They did a biopsy a week before asking the patients to come in and do you know, rigorous exercise for 10-15 minutes until they fail to do more. So they took a biopsy a week before. Then on the day after the uh, exercise, when the post-exertional malaise had set in, and then they took another biopsy and then they compared the tissues. Amazing study. So blood flow issues, no. Blood vessel issue, no. Any amyloids deposited in the blood vessel, no. In the output of the blood vessel, the venous return, the blood, when blood comes in and bathes the muscle and does its work and then finally gets out, when it gets out, blood had a very interesting set of metabolites in it. It had metabolites, the waste products, that were indicative that the muscle is actually causing glycolysis or anaerobic respiration and is not using oxygen and it is not using its mitochondria and it is not doing oxidative phosphorylation. So the TCA cycle, the Krebs cycle, the, which is an indication that there is oxygen present and the oxygen is being used and the mitochondria are working, those metabolites or those waste products were present less. But the waste product for glycolysis were increased. And uh, by less, what I mean is compared to the healthy control. So healthy control and the long COVID patients had the similar amounts of TCA waste products. But compared to healthy controls, the patients had a higher amount of glyco glycolysis waste products. That means their muscles were not using oxygen, their muscles were not using mitochondria correctly, and the muscles were using anaerobic respiration. Then... What they saw was that the muscle fiber types, physically the fiber types changed. From those fiber types, which can use oxygen and use mitochondria and work, these fiber types are difficult to fatigue because if they have a lot of blood supply to them, they get oxygen, they use mitochondria and they make their energy ATP in tons of amounts and they're fine. They are less fatigable. On the other hand, those muscle fibers that would only use glucose and not use oxidative parts, those become tired very quickly. We usually have 50% of each. And it's a long story for why these fibers are different and where do we use them. So that will become a different lecture. I'm not going to go there. But the, there became an abundance of the fibers that were glyco that were doing glycolysis instead of using mitochondria and doing Krebs cycles. But there was no problem with the oxygen delivery. It was not blood vessels' fault. So this was a huge deal that the fiber type. So if you are thinking right now that all right, 
the fiber types are changed and that is why I get fatigued so easily because I'm using fibers that are glycolytic fibers and they are becoming tired very fast because they use up the glucose and they produce the waste products, lactic acid and others. And one of the waste product is creatinine, in creatine in phosphate. The phosphate is the one that causes fatigue. So maybe that is why I'm fatigued. So maybe am I out of luck now that my f muscle fibers are changed? No, you're not. Light exercises will start moving these fibers back towards oxidative fibers. This is very important. Then what they saw was after this rigorous exercise and when the post-exertional malaise had set in for these patients, there some of the fibers. Do you see this muscle fiber? I made it very, very thin. They started doing atrophy. They started losing their content and started shrinking. Then they found some fibers that were actually dying. They were necrosed muscle, muscle tissue. Then they saw, if you see this little pile of trash over here, they saw amyloid deposits in the muscle. Amyloid deposits, amyloids are uh, proteins that are misfolded, proteins that are trash, proteins that are garbage. And they just sit there and like mud, they just occupy the place and they're dysfunctional and they make the surrounding tissue not function correctly either. They saw amyloid deposits to be present, but they did not see the amyloid deposit to be present in the blood vessels. So it was not microclotting. Blood vessels were fine, but there was deposits within the muscles and these were between the muscle fibers and muscle and blood vessels between them. Then they saw dysfunctional mitochondria. Mitochondria were present. Mitochondria had the enzymes in them, the machinery in them that was present and able to work. There was no problem with the machinery's quantity. But the mitochondria were not participating. Then they saw that in the muscle, there was infiltration of immune cells. Guess which immune cells? This actually blew my mind. Macrophages and helper T cells, but no B cells. Do you know what that means? Macrophages are present inside there and are causing inflammation. That is the innate arm. Then macrophages are going to activate the helper T cells. Helper T cells in turn will either activate the T helper 2 or become T helper 2 cells, which would then cause B cells to become plasma cell and make antibodies or T helper cells become T helper 1 and activate the cytotoxic T cells. I've been talking about it for three years. They did not find the B cells. That means cytotoxic pathway was being taken. This, this muscle was under attack by the, in, by the immune system which had come in the muscle. Very interesting. So this is the summary of it. If you just wanted to say, hey, what, was, what did they see in the muscle? They saw muscle fibers dying. They saw dead muscle fibers. They saw muscle fiber changed. They did not see any problem with the blood vascular input. They did see an output of a, a set of metabolites that was indicative that the glycolysis is working. Anaerobic glycolysis is happening. That means without oxygen, glucose is being used, which is a really bad way of using glucose, but it is useful in some physiological conditions. And they did not see much metabolites increased metabolites for TCA cycle or the oxidative phosphor phosphorylation. They saw amyloids, they saw macrophages, they saw T helper cells. These pathologies together resulted in PEM. Two things, reduced capacity of exercise, reduced power of exercise, reduced oxygen consumption and, and post-exertional malaise. They could not pinpoint that out of all of these, what exactly caused post-exertional malaise? But this is what they saw. Okay, so now you are up to speed with the study and what they were looking into it. If you just wanted to say, all right, I wanted to understand what it is, we're done. Now I'm gonna continue with the details of the study. They saw the heart 
to be okay. So in these patients, cardiovascular system was not to be blamed for any issues with the muscle. The heart was working fine. It was providing correct cardiac output. The blood vessels were clean. They were bringing in the blood to the muscles correctly. It was the muscle itself that had become uh, tr troubled. They then also wanted to see that is it that in the muscle there is the virus sitting in there? Is it the virus remnant present? So what they did was for that in, their, in those biopsies, they checked for nucleocapsid protein of the SARS-CoV-2. So here I made this like a skull because nucleocapsid protein inside the SARS-CoV-2 allows the RNA to wrap around it. It is like the skull of the virus. It's a protective protein for the genetic material of the virus. It's a very highly glycosylated protein. It is immunogenic as well, but they did not find the nucleocapsid protein inside the muscle. So it was not that the virus was sitting there and causing active problems three, four months after the infection. So it was not the nucleocapsid. Then what they saw was, they saw that the tissue, the muscle was using less oxygen, even when the oxygen was being delivered. And the tissues or these muscles were using more glucose. They were doing more anaerobic glycolysis instead of oxidative phosphorylation. So instead of using oxygen to make ATP and using that Krebs cycle and the oxidative phosphorylation pathway, instead of that, they, it was using a less uh, interesting path, pathway, and that is anaerobic glycolysis, which would end up creating less ATPs, plus it would create a lot of waste products, uh, including lactic acid. Many, many previous studies had said that lactic acid is the one that causes acidosis and causes muscle damage, but this uh, there have been very uh, recent studies or more studies that have shown that it's not really the lactic acid. It is the creatinine phosphate that is produced, and the phosphate part is the one that causes muscle fatigue and capacity issues. So they saw this change. Now, in all of us, let's say we are healthy, 50% of our, our muscle fibers kind of work with glycolysis and 50 work with oxygen. So we have a combination of both. In some people, in some athletics, the people we say naturally athletic, for example, sprinters, they may have 20% of one type and the 80% of the other. And weight trainers may have a different type. And if you do various kinds of exercises, you can also switch the fiber types. Now, talking about the fiber types, in a muscle, we have actually seven classes of muscle fibers. I'm only going to talk about two main classes. That is type 1 and type 2 muscle fibers. Type 1 fibers, if you see over here, this little cute turtle over here, ty type 1 fibers are called slow twitch fibers. They take a little time to twitch. They use oxygen. That means they use Krebs cycle and, uh, and oxidative phosphorylation. That means they have a lot of mitochondria in them. Because of this, they're also less fatigable. They're actually almost not fatigable. And they're used for endurance. For example, the muscles of your neck and the muscle of your back, which are always working to keep you upright and keep your neck moving, they are actually predominantly type 1 because these are slow twitch fibers, less powerful fibers, less movement uh, distance fibers, but less fatigable. On the other hand, there are another set of fibers called type 2 fibers. Type 2, so if you go from this side to this side, from slow, you'll become fast. So type 2 fibers are further divided into type 2A. And in animals, we say type 2B. In humans, we say type 2X. Type 2X fibers, muscle fibers, they are the ones that use glucose primarily. They do anaerobic glycolysis instead of using mitochondria and oxygen, this is by design they do that. And the benefit is that if you are going to sprint, if you're going to do some explosive movement, you need your muscle to very quickly move. And for that movement, you need immediate availability of 
ATP. So the fastest way to produce ATP is anaerobic glycolysis, which doesn't go through Krebs cycle and, and oxidative phosphorylation. You just bring in glucose, you break it down and you get your ATP. So these fibers are fast fiber, but because they're not working with oxygen, they're working in anaerobic state. They become fatigued very fast because the metabolites that are produced in these fibers, they would cause fatigue of the muscle. So these are the ones where you just want to do some explosive movement, but you cannot continue doing that for hours. For example, a sprinter who's going to sprint for, you know, 90 seconds will sprint hard and to find off in the middle of both of these. My apologies, I saw a little uh, n little break in my presentation. Apologies for that. So I hope you can hear me. I hope you can hear me and I hope you can see this. Okay, very good. So then there is this type 2A fibers, which are kind of a hybrid of both of these. They are half oxidative and they are half glycolytic. So they have mitochondria as well, but they also can work with the glucose. These are the fibers that sit in the middle of both of these type of fibers. They are fatigable, but not as much fatigable as 2X, but they can also use oxygen as well. And that is why they can do more endurance. Plus they can do more explosive activity as well. So we need all three fiber types. Now, before we move forward, think about these fibers and think which one are really important for exercises. When you're doing exercises, you need oxidative fibers so you don't become fatigued. You need them to use mitochondria so you don't become fatigued. If you use glyco glycolysis doing fibers, then you'll become fatigued fast. Guess what? These fibers were reduced in these patients. Guess which fibers were increased? These fibers were increased. That means that these patients have a physical structural change in the muscle that as soon as they'll work, they'll become fatigued. It's not in their head. Good news is once again, as they would start doing light exercises and yogas and those, they can start bringing themselves out of it. Okay, continuing. So what happened was in these patients' biopsies, they saw that type 2A and type 2X, A and B, they were abundantly present. But type 1 and type 2A, these two guys, these two guys, they were present. They use the word rare. They were rarely present. Think about a muscle that doesn't have oxidative fiber a lot anymore. That muscle is not going to do a lot of enduring activity. It's going to use these fast glycolytic fibers. It would rapidly do glycolysis and then it would fatigue. So capacity is reduced because there are no mitochondrial usages or less mitochondrial usages. There is no oxygen usages. Plus the waste products would cause the muscle to become fatigued. So power is reduced, capacity is reduced, fatigability is increased. This, according to the study, does not explain why the patient gets post-exertional malaise, why they get exacerbation of their symptoms. But these are the changes that they were seeing. I had never thought that the long COVID will be causing muscle fiber type shifts. Because the answer to this one is to start doing light exercises and start, start to come out of it. Don't let people give you blood thinners if this is the situation. Okay, so now some more data from this study about the mitochondria. They said succinate dehydrogenase activity, a marker for mitochondrial content correlated with VO2 in healthy controls. What they're talking about is inside the mitochondria, there's an enzyme called succinate dehydrogenase that does par take part in these uh, metabolic pathways that run in the mitochondria. The 
this enzyme is used as a proxy to understand if the mitochondria are working or not. So they saw that the succinate dehydrogenase was working fine, but not in patients. While patients had a significantly lower oxidative phosphorylation capacity, think about this with me, they had a lower oxidative phosphorylation capacity, that means they were using their mitochondria less. No difference was observed in SDH activity. Their succinate dehydrogenase enzyme was working fine. That means inside the mitochondria, the machinery was present. This is like if you and me, we are all sitting in a room and we are all workers and we are present in the room. But we don't work correctly. We don't work coordinate correctly. We do not work with each other correctly. And the outcome is even when we are present, the overall machine is not providing its output. They called it the qualitative mitochondrial problem. So here they say, so no difference was observed in SDH, suggestive of qualitatively lower mitochondrial respiration rather than a lower mitochondrial enzyme activity. It was not the inside machinery that was not present. Machinery was present, work was not good. Collectively, our data indicate that the lower exercise capacity in long COVID patients is associated with a greater proportion of high fatigable glycolytic fibers and lower mitochondrial function with a possible additional limitation of lower capillarization and the ventilatory system. So leaving all this geek talk here, what they're saying is muscle fiber types changed and mitochondria didn't work correctly. Then the metabolites. I have actually talked about it a few times, but I just wanted you to have a look at it. Or if somebody would like to pause this and read this or go to the study and read it, what they're saying over here in this paragraphs are that the if you look at the output from a muscle, the blood that is coming out of a muscle, that would tell you how the muscle is working. If the muscle is doing oxidative phosphorylation or using oxygen and doing the right thing, using mitochondria, performing non fatigable actions, you would see metabolites, the waste products that are coming out of the muscle, which will be for the TCA cycle or the Krebs cycle or this, this pathway. On the other hand, if you have a muscle, that said, you know what, I'm not going to use my mitochondria very well. I'm not going to do Cori cycle. I'm just going to use glucose in anaerobic state like behavior and do anaerobic glycolysis. Then you would end up receiving a lot of lactic acid and creatinine phosphate type products. And what they found was that in the long COVID patients, the products that were coming out of the muscle, the blood that was received out, that had more glycolytic metabolites compared to oxidative metabolites. Muscle, not only it had changed its fibers, it had changed its policy of using anaerobic glycolysis. They don't know why. And if, if I try to, I might be wrong. It may be because of the immunological status within the muscle, the immune in infiltration, the amyloids, the damage to the mitochondria, it may be something to do with that, but they don't know and I do not know. So if you see here, glycolytic metabolites in the venous blood were significantly higher, but pyruvate, other TCA cycle metabolites were lower in patients with com compared to control. Glycolytic metabolites, fatigable muscles activity was higher. Non-fatigable muscle activity, TCA cycle metabolites were not present higher or better than controls. The induction of post exertional malaise led to reduction in blood glycolytic metabolites after one week without changes in TCA cycle. So TCA cycle between the control and the patient were the same. So that means they were acting the same way. But glycolytic metabolites kept high for a week. So their muscle once got stuck in that state, stayed that way for a week. 
We conclude that TCA cycle metabolites were lower in skeletal muscles and blood in long COVID patients, but did not change during post-exertional malaise. Venous blood glycolytic metabolites were higher at baseline and during. Okay, next. Capillarization. Capillarization means your, your muscles are made up of thousands and thousands of fibers. So blood supply is adjusted according to the number of fibers there. For example, I'm just going to make up something. I'm going to say for every 100 fibers, we need two capillaries to supply them nutrition. I'm just making it up. So that means if I have 1,000 fibers, then I need two per 100 so I need whatever, 20 capillaries. So they were interested, the researchers, to say, is there a problem with the capillaries? Are the number of capillaries lesser? And they say they did not really see much difference in capillarization of the muscle. So if you see here, we conclude this is a very important area. We conclude that amyloid-containing deposit, deposits are not present within capillaries. So first they're talking about the capillary health. And this is why I said that NPR article, it uses Dr. Rasia Pretorius, which I really like. I have talked about her studies as well. But I think this is her, uh, uh, she does plasma electrophoresis, I believe, to help against the clotting or clean up the clots. So I think for her, everything is clotting. They are writing here, keep an eye on this one. The researchers are saying, neither did we observe any sign of skeletal muscle tissue hypoxia. There was no problem with oxygen delivery. As a skeletal muscle capillary to fiber ratio, capillary density and intracellular and circulating lactate concentrations were not different between patient and control. The number of capillaries, or capillary to fiber ratio, the concentration of the lactate that was being produced, and the intracellular and circulating lactate concentrations, they were the same. So blood vascular system was fine. There were no amyloids in it. There were no deposits in it. There were no clots in it. Therefore, we conclude that post-exertional malaise cannot be explained by the hypothesis that the deposits block blood vessel perfusion, causing local tissue hypoxia. They said, at least in our study with looking at the muscle biopsy, we cannot say that it is the blood vessels that are loaded up or that are blocked or that are inflamed. The underlying reason for the increased intramuscular accumulation of amyloid containing deposits during post-exertional malaise remain elusive. This is from the study, right? I want to show you something, which I think it's a problem with the journalistic integrity as well. So you just read here that they're saying, hey, there is no amyloid inside the blood vessels. There is no problem with the blood vessel. There is no pro problem with the blood supply. The underlying reason for the increased intramuscular accumulation of amyloid deposits during exercise remain elusive. This is what they're saying, right? Look at this. In the NPR article, they went to Dr. Rasia Pretorius and asked her about this study. Either she didn't read it or she just said this. That means the microclots can actually have traveled through the damaged vasculature into the muscle. What is scary but poss possibly very significant is that the, this might be happening to other tissues as well. Man, it is written in this study that there was nothing in the blood vessels. If the vasculature is totally short, Pretorius says, the mitochondria will be massively affected, although more work needs to be done before drawing definitive conclusions. Why the blood vasculature is totally short? They're saying blood to fiber to capillary ratio is fine. There is no amyloid in blood vessel. There is no hypoxia. There is no delivery problem. Strange. Okay, continuing. What else did they see in the muscle? They saw that the muscle had infiltration. That means 
unnecessary presence of the immune cells. Macrophages are present everywhere. But here, CD68 positive macrophages were present and CD3 helper T cells were present. But B cells were not present. So the problem, the, the thing that I just discussed before, you might be thinking that what amyloid is he talking about? Inside the muscle, they found amyloids. I'll talk a little later. Inside the muscle, they found amyloid or this mud, garbage, trash proteins present between the muscle fibers and present between the muscle fiber and the blood vessels. This is like trash and garbage stuck at various parts in a room. So the question is, where is the amyloid coming from? It doesn't have to come from the blood circulation, although it can, but it doesn't have to come from the circulation. Tissues can make their own amyloid. And that autoimmune system, the immune system is responsible for helping make amyloids. Sometimes there is genetic problem with the cell and the cell is making a protein and that is folded incorrectly and that can make amyloids. But here, because there is an infiltration of inflammatory cells, they can lead to production of amyloids. And here is the other journalistic in inaccuracy I want to show you. They called it, they called them microclots. The tissue samples from the long COVID patients also revealed severe muscle damage, a disturbed immune response, and a buildup of, of microclots. Although, when you have garbage proteins accumulated and making little lumps, you can call them clots. But in medical sciences, clot has a very specific definition where we have the platelets and the fibrins and all those chemicals and they're sitting together and they make a clot. That is what we call a clot. We don't start calling every amyloid a clot. So this is an article about the study. They actually have this study author's comments in there as well. And they have so much misrepresented that if you read this article, you would actually learn the opposite of what is in the study. I could not imagine this. I was shocked. Anyways, so in the muscles, they found amyloids. And they found macrophages and they found T helper cells. They didn't find the B cells, which means if I repeat this, my apologies for this. Here is a macrophage. That macrophage is interacting with a T helper cell, this guy. The T helper cell can go T helper 2 pathway or it can go T helper 1 pathway. T helper 2 pathway will cause a B cell to become a plasma cell and the plasma cell will make antibodies. If you go T helper 1 pathway, it would cause cytotoxic T cells to become activated, which would kill the cells. So think about it with me. If there are no B cells, that means the T cells are not taking this pathway. That means they're taking this pathway. That means there are going to be cytotoxic T cells sitting somewhere damaging the muscle fibers. Now about the amyloids. This is a muscle fiber bundle. On it, these are the blood vessels. And these little things between them are amyloids. So check this out, what they're saying. They're saying visualizing amyloid containing deposits together with capillaries or lymph vessels not only capillaries, they're looking in lymph as well, revealed that the skeletal amyloid containing deposits were not located in the capillaries or lymphatic vessels, but rather next to capillaries and in the extracellular matrix between muscle fibers. In this one, I saw another journalistic error and that was, they said, well, the amyloids are present next to the blood vessels. It means that they came out of the blood vessels. Why to mislead people who are suffering? 
Okay. Visualizing amyloid containing deposits together with capillaries or lymph vessels revealed that the skeletal amyloid containing deposits were not located in capillaries or lymphatic vessels, but rather next to capillaries and in the extracellular matrix between muscle fibers. Amyloid containing deposits did not overlap with cell nuclei, suggesting that these deposits are located outside of the infiltrating immune cells. We conclude that amyloid containing deposits are not present within capillaries. Neither did we observe any signs of skeletal muscle hy tissue hypoxia at, as a skeletal muscle capillary to fiber ratio was fine. Okay, so that's that. Then about the muscle itself. If I ask you in the study, what changes did they see in the muscle? So, of course, they saw the immune system infiltrating in there. They saw amyloids that are present in there. They saw normal capillarization, maybe slightly lesser than the healthy. 0 0.8 was the percentage of the capillarization or, or 80%. So, slightly lesser. They saw that the muscle phenotype was changing. The type 1 fiber and type 2A fibers were less, which are needed for oxidative work and less fatigable work, and the more fatigable fibers were more. They saw mitochondria were not functioning correctly, but my mitochondria had the correct enzymes in them. They saw muscles were atrophied, fibers were shrinking and kind of withering away, and they saw fibers dying. So let's call that muscle damage. So about muscle, we conclude that severe exercise induced muscle damage and subsequent regeneration are associated with pathophysiology of post-exertional malaise and can possibly explain muscle pain, fatigue, and weakness in patients with long COVID. Then they say, despite this, so regenerating fiber. So what happens is when you do exercises, it's actually beautiful physiology, muscular skeletal system. When you're doing exercises, the myosin heads, we should talk at another time about them. Myosin heads get damaged. This is like gears in a system. When you run the gears again and again, the gear would start breaking. So when those gears are broken, in our muscles, there are small, um, uh, what are these, uh, stem cells that would help reproduce those muscle heads, myosin heads. Myosin heads are the ones that use glycolysis or oxidation. You can, with exercise, change one kind of muscle head with the other, just like a cartridge or a new gear. So you can actually have a muscle fiber that is working with glycolysis and not really very good for us. And you can, with slight exercises, start moving it in the direction of making oxidative fibers. It can take weeks and months but it would happen. So they said, and what happens is when this micro trauma occurs inside the muscle, muscle fibers can start regenerating their, their structures inside. So both groups, healthy and long COVID, presented with more regenerating fibers following the second biopsy, indicating possible effect of the first biopsy, meaning damage done by the first biopsy and the muscles were recovering. Despite this, long COVID patient had more internal nuclei atrophic fibers, focal necrosis after induction of post exertional malaise. As I said before, atrophic or shrinking fibers leaving their contents out and kind of becoming, you know, useless. And necrosis is dead fiber. So last part, I'm so sorry, we went on for 48 minutes. In conclusion, this study reveals that local and systemic metabolic disturbances Severe exercise-induced myopathy, muscle damage, inflammation, infiltration of amyloid-containing deposits, and immune cells in skeletal muscles of long COVID are key characteristic of post-exertional malaise. They are not able to put their finger on which one actually causes it, but this is the collective shape of the muscle pathology. While these explain the symptomatology of post-exertional malaise in long COVID, the molecular pathways underlying these alterations in patients suffering from post exertion malaise remain to be determined. Why did this happen? Who called the, the inflammatory cells to be present in there? 
What happened? Why did the mitochondrial usage became less? Why did these muscle fibers change over to the other type? They say, we do not know. So for me, there are two lessons clinically. Number one, we have to make sure that the patient and their inflammation is controlled. Number two, exercise and not strenuous exercise, not the exercise that is going to damage you, that, was, that is going to trigger PEM, light exercises, inflammatory control. And the patients, I believe, majority of them would benefit from it. So this is the discussion. Thank you very much for listening in for such a long topic. But I think this is one breakthrough study in three years in this area that offers a lot of help. So MM says, can you reverse necrosis? No, you cannot. Necrosis mean the dead tissue, but you can replace them. So you can make fibers. You can, uh, muscles are, our muscles, look, if you stretch your muscles, that causes a stretch in the muscle. Muscles are inside a bag that is called sarcolemma. It's a covering around them. That covering elongates and in the long, the longer part, the elongated part, new muscle fiber uh, length generates, meaning muscle fiber become lengthy and put new muscle machine there. If we cause micro trauma by doing exercises, our heads actually start changing. We can shift from type A to type 2, from type 2 to type A. This is what bodybuilders and sprinters do. When they're training, they're actually shifting their muscle from one type to another. Just the inflammation has to be controlled. In my opinion, this amyloid that is getting deposited, the macrophages and the helper cells that are present, they are going to cause damage. And so we have to make sure that the inflammation stays controlled so the mud amyloid doesn't get deposited. You can't take amyloid out. And then the third one is mitochondria. We have discussed many times what are the mitochondria health um, uh, things that we can do. So watch for them. And that is a discussion. Thank you very much. I could not do justice to the whole study. I think I could talk for two more hours. But these are the highlights of the study. I would request you to look into it yourself as well. And then please like, subscribe, and share if you get some value from this. And if you want to have more lectures of this kind, drbean.com, become members, or Substack member, or Patreon member, whichever you like. Thank you very much, and I'll see you next time.